Marlin batting order. The team that leads the conference in slugging percentage and home runs. Five different guys batting better than 300. Chris Aline in the middle, the Big Ten leader with 16 dingers. And Nick LaRusso, what a professional hitter, truly embodies uh, the type of talent that we have playing in this series. The number three hitter for the Terps. Uh, here is Luke Schliger, the Big Ten leader in walks. And he gets hit by the pitch. Looked like a curveball there from Bello that ran inside. And so Schliger quickly aboard on the HBP. His on-base percentage near 500. So even though he's Maryland's catcher, he is the prototypical leadoff hitter from a hitting perspective. Yeah, it's a lot like Jason Kendall, perhaps uh, a catcher that led off uh, for a, a large percentage of his career. But he's also so athletic, and he's a fiery tone setter uh, of this team. Got to bring up Chris Aline for the first time. Now the numbers on Aline are outstanding. Came back for this fifth year and having the best year of his college career. The power numbers are off the charts. More home runs this year than his first four years combined. And how about the two home runs yesterday? Uh, the ball was flying out and, and uh, asking Rob Vaughn, head coach of Maryland, about the home runs yesterday. This Maryland's uh, team's power is to right center field uh, for the right-handed batters, and they showed that beautifully. A 1-1 pitch from Bello floats outside, so it's 2-1. And, and for Sam Bello, uh, it, I think this is about his secondary stuff. Uh, uh, these are all professional hitters that can hit the fastball. He needs to get ahead consistently today, uh, which, of course, is, is the obvious. But when you're making your first career start, uh, you want to be in a position where you're pitching from ahead. Relievers are accustomed, though, to pitching with guys on base. Uh, but, but he is in a position where he'd like to pace himself. Well, it's a hitter's count for a lean at three balls and a strike. And Bellows pitch. And he's fouled straight back. Bellows got a fastball. His main secondary pitch is a slider. We've also seen the changeup in this at bat already against Aline. Got a swing and miss on it. So Bellows back at it. Three balls and two strikes with Schliger leading off first. A good stolen base threat. And the pitch. It's pop foul behind the plate. Now for Bello, this is his 35th career appearance. So he's got a two-year track record as a reliever. Last year, one of the best relievers in the Big Ten, and this year he's been one of the top long relievers for the Scarlet Knights. Rudder going. It's a payoff, and it's tipped foul. Yeah, I like the hit and run from Maryland, and neither team really did a ton of running yesterday, uh, and, and that is something from Schliger just to give Bellow something to think about. We'll try it again. And Aline flicks it foul. Uh, Bello making his first career start today because Rutgers left this final game as a TBD. They've been looking for consistency in this traditionally Sunday game, the third one. And in the end, opting with Bello, who was not used in either game yesterday. Yeah, and I think he's been showing that he's capable with his back-to-back four-inning appearances. Uh, but also Rutgers, I think, is set up okay if if he doesn't go long, for if he only goes a couple innings, they can go to the pen. Runners going, and the pitch is cranked out to right center field. Coming on is Sheikhofer, and it hops in front of him. And he tried to deke Schliger there by putting the glove up, but Aline dunks it in between... Lasco and Sheikhofer, and Maryland has its first two batters on base. Yeah, that's just weak contact, but I'll tell you what, Luke Schliger shows me uh, tremendous instincts by how he handled this as a base runner. Look at him watching the fielders. He sees the ball, locates it, and I think he just had a sense that there would be enough backspin on the ball that it would dunk in for a base hit. Uh, and now, of course, he is aboard at second, and uh, great speed ahead of LaRusso. So Aline wins the nine-pitch battle, and now Nick LaRusso 
And he blasts this to left. Slight drifting back and now slows up right in front of the track and makes the catch. Had a good sound off the bat, but couldn't ping it enough, and LaRusso down for the first time today. Yeah, hit it well. He, he, I think he got a fastball in the inner part of the plate and still was able no, to turn man. on it. The shortstop, number six, Matt. Now, Sam Bellow sure. does have the benefit of pitching in front of the Big Ten's best defense, and we saw that on display yesterday. Some ridiculous plays by the infielders. Danny DiGiorgio had a couple of plays in the hole. And there's how Rutgers lines up. Andy Axelson gets the start behind the plate today with Samillo DHing. Here's a cleanup hitter, Matt Shaw. And he's swinging on the first pitch, fouls it straight back. Impressed with this sophomore's power yesterday, hitting a solo home run, his 12th of the year, to right center field in uh, yesterday's game one. Uh, that, was, that was quite the blast. Uh, there were many. Uh, where well, the ball was hit from the outer part of the plate to deep parts in right center field. We had 15 combined home runs. The team with more home runs won each game. Although when you, if you saw the final scores of the two games, Maryland won the first one 16 to eight, and Rutgers came back for an 18 to seven win. A home run here or there wouldn't have really made the difference. And uh, I think what, what the winning team did uh, in each game was that they put up the big innings. And conversely, the losing team was not able to defuse the big innings. Each team was able to score. Uh, Rutgers less so in game one because the Maryland number one, Ryan Ramsey, is a you know, top five round uh, draft pick potential. So Rutgers did the majority of their damage against the bullpen. But uh, particularly in game two, when you didn't have great, great pitching, you know, top five round type pitching, it was more about the big inning being limited. Uh, and that's what Rutgers is able to do. 1-1 oh, one, one breaking ball dives low. Two balls and a strike to Shaw. And that's why today, uh, Nick Deem starting for Maryland, I, I think uh, both head coaches uh, feel like they have enough uh, bullpen arms at their uh, availability. They can go six pitchers each to get this series win. This one is a slow tapper to short. To Giorgio Field steps on the bag, throws it to double play. Right on cue, there is the Rutgers middle infield. And it's the sixth year senior shortstop, Danny DiGiorgio, who helps San Bello out of the top of the first. Now, Lasco in the second game yesterday went five for five, his first career five hit game. He had a wild series last weekend at Ohio State, had a three home run game Saturday, and then two more homers on Sunday. The five hit game yesterday was a multi home run game, and so. He's in a position where he's playing the best two weeks of baseball that anybody has in recent memory with this program. Yeah, asking Rob Vaughn in particular, he, he mentioned uh, Ryan Lasko, uh, his swings and misses compared to last year are way down. And how he's elevating the ball, and, uh, and uh, he has turned himself into, uh, what Rob says, I mean, uh, this guy is now, he, he has turned into a pro. Uh, he is as dangerous as anybody that they talk about in the scouting report about, about Rutgers, and that says a lot. Nick Dean trying to go off speed there, but Lasko fouls it back, so it stays the ball in two strikes. It's a four-pitch mix for Nick Dean. And the off speed is hit hard to short. Great play by Shaw to his left. Gets up, throws to first. He's out. Man, nifty stuff by Matt Shaw, taking a hit away from Ryan Lasko. That's amazing. Maybe someone has done the study, skipping the ball over, hmm. To first base. And this is whacked over to second. Keister is there for a more routine play, and it's two quick outs for Nick Dean. Yeah, the ball thrown up in the air there uh, for some reason. I don't know why that was. You saw it on uh, that play by Shaw. The ball got some good spin off its hop off the artificial turf. So that's two quick outs here for Dean on the ground, and now here's Nick Samillo for the first time today. Samillo getting a DH after catching both games yesterday. And he fouls that back. Dean quickly ahead once again. No balls and two strikes. A 
This is the defense that Dean plays in front of. Again, a high-quality defense with the Terrapins. Fielding percentage not quite as high, but you've seen some of the stellar plays. You look just yesterday, Troy Schreffler robbed Tony Santamaria of a three-run home run. Yeah, Schreffler uh, actually, uh, Rob Vaughn feeling like Troy Schreffler has a chance to kind of be the Ryan Lasko breakout guy the rest of the season. That's Before strike Maryland. three on the outside corner. Nick Dean takes out the paintbrush for a 1-2-3 first inning of work. Yeah, this is a changeup. This is Dean's best pitch. And Samillo looking for something else. Just for to the second inning in Piscataway. Maryland will send up five, six, and seven for the first time against Sam Bello. And he starts off Troy Schreffler with a nice looking slider. It's sort of a slurvy pitch. Got some slider bend sometimes, got some more curvier bend on, on that instance. Regardless, it's strike one. That's the fastball, and it's hit high in the sky, foul ground. Santa Maria looks to be under it, and he makes the catch. Not a single cloud in the sky, so just beaming sun rays for the fielders trying to track down some of those high pops. And for Sam Bello, he has had uh, many appearances in his career that were multiple Four, inning, where you go back in the dugout, you come back out. Uh, he had one of his uh, most notable saves last year for Maryland against number 25 Michigan. He went three and two thirds innings. So uh, that's, that's an effect almost like a start. You know, that's going in and out of the dugout three times. And there's a hook for strike one to Maxwell Costas, another prolific home run hitter. Now, Bello last year was Maryland's closer. Ranked among the Big Ten leaders with seven saves. As Costas sits his high in the sky to Lasco, but he had to golf it. And so Lasco is there, two gone. Now, you talked about it, too, extended to this year now with Sam Bello. It's been back-to-back -back outings of four innings each. One combined run on six hits between those outings against Iowa and then at Ohio State the, this past weekend. Yeah, and those are you know, fully funded Big Ten programs, uh, no slouches. Those, those aren't hollow innings. Uh, and in both games, uh, while Rutgers won both games, 10-4 Iowa, 13-3 Ohio State. Bello came in, the games were still very much in the balance. So uh, that was not mop-up. Uh, those were real innings that Steve Owens gave him a chance, and he performed. Now Bobby Smarzlak bangs this to center field. Lasko goes back. He looks up. He's got no chance. Bobby Smarzlak starts the home run hitting here on this Monday afternoon. Maryland takes a 1-0 lead. Well, leave it to the guy that was a club, a travel baseball teammates with Sam Bello for the program in Connecticut called the Clubhouse to homer off of him in this start. Smarslack with his super professional approach at all times. Uh, only hitting 281 this year with 12 home runs. Uh, but, but, but he is a guy, when you look, he just kind of has a hitting coach mentality to him. And yeah, now Ian Petrutz takes on the outside corner, strike one. You mentioned, though, for Smarslack, it's a dozen home runs, 31 RBI. No weak spots in this Maryland lineup. Uh, there, there really isn't. And if they did have one, perhaps the DH spot that Petrutz has has uh, seized and taken his own. Petrutz going into yesterday had started seven of eight games in Big Ten. Started both games yesterday. He was hitting 375 to lead Maryland in conference games for a true freshman. Petrutz on 0-2, flicks it, foul ground. Oh, now back into fair play. Santa Maria stays on his feet and makes the catch. Right down the line, that would have been a fair ball. And Santa Maria reels it in to end the top of the second. But McDean, one, two, three, through his first inning of work, took just 11 pitches. He's looked really good so far. Chris Breida, the first hitter he'll face in his second inning. And is a breaking ball for strike one. Uh, Chris Brito has terrorized Maryland, somebody that Rob Vaughn is very excited to see drafted at some point soon. And he had two more home runs yesterday. He had four last year against the Terps. Uh, and, uh, and he hammers this one high in the sky to left center field. Aline is back at the fence. There's another one. 
Chris Brito goes deep against the Terps once again. And just like that, the ball game's tied at one. Smarslack with a 400 footer. Brito goes 380 or so, just to the left of dead center. And for Chris Brito, just adding on to the power numbers. 14 homers, 63 RBI. As Evan Slight flicks this high in the sky, shallow center. Shaw calls off Keister, and he's there for the catch. To Rutgers 18-7, and he just thought, you know, we probably had a little bit of an emotional letdown once Jason Savakul, their starter, had to leave the game after an inning with a back injury. Uh, and then uh, and then kind of their hitters, uh, once you kind of fall behind, it kind of starts to weigh on you. You get a little exhausted uh, because it's a long day of baseball, and they just couldn't get to get put together maybe that one big inning to get their energy level up, uh, and that's it. And uh, basically seven and a half hours later of of two games of Big Ten baseball, it was 1-1. It's, it's hard to keep that up uh, steady for so long. On two to Tony Santamaria is spiked in the dirt, two and two. Yeah, a long day, you add up the time of the game and it was six and a half hours combined of baseball. Swing and a miss. Fastball upstairs. Nick Dean has his second strikeout. Uh, so he is a guy that you know you can expect to go five innings with a little bit of a leash. And he's gone six innings three times this year against Big Ten opponents. And he started the season against good programs at Baylor in the season opener, at Campbell, who could be an NCAA tournament team. And he shut out Campbell going seven scoreless with three hits. Swing and a miss. That was some nasty break on the offering. Looked like the change there from Dean. He gets ahead on Josh Kuroda Grauer. A ball and two strikes. Looking for another punch out. Instead, it's hammered through the middle and it's past Keister into center field. Josh Kuroda Grauer, who has had a great freshman campaign, just got off the Schneid. He was 0 for his last 14 going back to last weekend, but now he's got a hit and Rutgers has a two out base runner. I don't think he's carried it over from at-bat to at-bat. Uh, you don't see that in his body language uh, or him extending the strike zone. Uh, I, I think it's just more more random chance that he's not getting hits. Uh, but it is not where where you come away saying Josh Corona Grauer is just looking terrible at the plate. That's not really occurring uh, uh, with him. And a check on Corona Grauer. He dives back in. It's Richie Sheikoffer at the plate now, another Maryland transfer. She called for yesterday, had a pair of extra base hits, including a home run. Dean working from the stretch with the guy on base. Uh, she called for reaches down to get it. Aline had a good jump on it, still coming, and makes the hat high catch. And then will end the inning. And it's up and down the lineup. It's not just concentrated in three or four guys. And this goes back to Rob Vaughn when he was an assistant coach with three major leaguers that were the top of the order for the 2015 NCAA regional team of, uh, of Lamonte Wade, uh, Kevin Smith, Brandon Lau, uh, Lau most notably uh, with the Tampa Bay Rays. Uh, uh, he's more of kind of like a, a speed guy, but in, in talking to him, it's, it's more about approach. Hit through the middle of the middle of the field, and eventually natural power will take over. Uh, and he has a he has a tremendous team. And well, what I notice when you have a power team, sometimes you have a, some more free swingers. He does not have that. He has a team full of guys with professional approaches that happen to hit for power. Oh. It's a credit to Rob Vaughn and also to their hitting coach, Matt Swope, that you see Maryland break that kind of record with still two weekends of regular season play left. As Kevin Keister drives this one to right field, Sheikhoffer looks up, there's another one! They keep on hitting homers! Number 89, 
Now 90 for the Terrapins, and they go back in front 2-1. to one. I tell you, there is something about power to right center field for this Maryland team, but it is uncanny. Uh, and, and, and this guy, Kevin Keister, uh, he, Rob couldn't say enough about him for a number nine batter uh, that accepts his role, uh, that hits in situations really well, a well over 300 hitter, but can lay down a bunt so fundamentally sound, might have the highest IQ on the team, and he can make adjustments, especially with all those hitters that are on base all the time in front of him as a number nine guy. And, and wow, there is... Uh, you know, we wondered, is the ball just carrying a little bit more yesterday than a regular day? But uh, these are all just solid swings with legitimate power, taking the ball from the outer part of the plate to right center. Now Kevin Keister has his second straight game of the home run. It was the grand slam yesterday in the second game. Seven dingers this year as Luke Schliger is back at the plate. And now he drives this to center, and it sends Lasko back, but he's got space. And Maryland putting some balls in the sky off their former teammate, Sam Bello, who's one gone. And look, that's going to be a part of it. Uh, there is familiarity with this Maryland offense with Sam Bello. Uh, that's the bottom line, because when you play intra-squad, uh, for example, when teams play their intra-squad fall World Series, the teams are split up. There are guys in this Maryland team, that have probably, such as Marslak, that have probably faced Sam Bello 50 times. That's a lot in college. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, between all the times you spend in fall ball, and, and the I'll fall World Series, you'll play against each other, work during the winter, sure. And I'll go back to Zmarslak. Has a lean takes there, nothing in two. Uh, he and they're both in the same they're both in the same high school class of 2019, so they're both uh, from the clubhouse in Connecticut, so they're playing travel ball together, working out together. Again, it's a change up there from Sam Bello. Doesn't throw it a ton in normal relief outings, but this is not a normal relief outing for Sam Bello. It's his first career start, and he strikes out Chris Aline. First K of the day for Sam Bello. Yeah, he shows great feel for this pitch. So he keeps the lean off balance, and now Nick LaRusso. And the breaking ball stays high and tight. And LaRusso is a year ahead of Bello, but within the same travel baseball program in Connecticut. But I'm sure they they probably worked out together, faced one another. So uh, that makes a big difference at, at this stage. Uh, you have recent video to go off the way these programs can scout now with the data and the statistics uh, that's available at the college baseball level and the familiarity where uh, LaRusso's probably, uh, you know, between two years, at, uh, uh, at least in Zmar's last case, two years at Maryland, and then maybe three years of travel ball together. That's over 50 at-bats. 1-1, one, one. and once again, it's the breaking ball from Bellow. It's worked really well. Strike two. Now Bellow has bounced back from the Kevin Keister solo shot to get two consecutive outs. And looking to end the inning. This has popped up. On the infields, everybody converges, but who will claim it? Burrito is there, and he has it. Burrito catches it. DiGiorgio was right there in case his teammate couldn't. Andy Axelson is in the box for the first time as we start the bottom of the third inning here in Piscataway. Rutgers and Maryland are wrapping up a three-game series here in the middle of May. You've got two weekends left of Big Ten baseball after this. And this is a significant rubber match after the two teams split a twin bill yesterday. Rutgers came back from a 16-8 loss in game one to win the second game 18-7. If the Scarlet Knights win this, they cut their magic number to clinch a share of the Big Ten title to one. If Maryland wins it, it ties Rutgers in the loss column with the two weekends left. And uh, I think it's not just about the title, but because because of the RPI bump that Rutgers can get from this game, and they only have three games left. Rob Vaughn's team still has six left. One, two on the outside corner. That's a great spot for it. Looks like the cutter there from Dean. He gets a strikeout. Third one of the day. And Eddie Ax Now Ryan Lasco. He grounded out to short on a great play by Matt Shaw his first time up. 
but just to encapsulate the RPI numbers, and that's a significant deal for Rutgers because it's lower than it would prefer. Well, strike two. Rutgers, after the doubleheader yesterday, saw its RPI bump up 10 spots. That moved up to 43. Maryland moved up five spots to 22. Those are the top two RPIs in the conference. The one, two. It's low. Yeah, I would, I would imagine that Rutgers will be, should they win this game, that would push them inside the top 40. Conversely, for Maryland, uh, boy, another couple spots inside the top 20. Uh, then I think Rob Vaughn could start to sell his team on the possibility, and however true it is or not. But look, we are now on the outside of a potential trying to bid for being a host of a super regional. If you get into the, you know, into the upper teen spot of the RPI. That three-two is rolled over to second this time. Keister, nice play to his left. And Ryan Lasko grounds out for the second time today. I don't think that would be that outlandish to kind of put that carrot in front of your team and say, look, if we go, we take this game, you go five and one over your last six in the Big Ten, and uh, whatever else Maryland has left on their schedule, you'll get that. It's, it's been very difficult for teams in, in the Northeast or the North to ever get them. Uh, there's so much slanted against them, but uh, they've got a home game against JMU left too, decent CAA program as well. Uh, to help boost things up. So I don't think that carrot is, is crazy to, to put out there for the Terps, uh, you know, as they start the day at 21. 1-1-2 one, one, to Giorgio. That's a top of the zone strike. 1-2. and two. Uh, Nick Dean is looking for his second 1-2-3 frame. It's been economical. The pitch. And Giorgio does a nice job laying off the off speed. Two balls and two strikes. Well, for Maryland, that's their goal, host a regional. For Rutgers, the goal is to shore up a spot, period. A 2-2 struck well, but Shaw takes it off the turf. A snow cone on a sunny Monday. That Shaw has been sharp at shortstop. And he takes a possible hit away from Danny DiGiorgio on that dying liner. Nick Dean has retired four straight Scarlet Knights. As we go on to the fourth, his Terrapins lead by one as Matt Shaw, Troy Schreffler, and Maxwell Costas will come to the plate for Maryland. Now Sam Bellow just threw his 40th pitch. If you're just joining us, Bellow has been a long reliever for Rutgers this year. He's making his first career start, and it comes against his old team. Now Bellow has gone several innings. His last two outings have been four innings each. That includes an outing two weekends ago against Iowa. He threw 66 pitches. So he's got some length left. 2-0. This one's hit really well to center. Lasco driving back hard. Will he have a play? No! Yet another one for Maryland. The Terrapins hit homers better than anybody in the Big Ten. It's their third solo shot of the day. They're in front by two. And this is a high fastball. Uh, I mean, I continue to be so impressed by several of these Maryland players. I mean, when you watch Matt Shaw uh, play shortstop, and then he showed power to right center yesterday. Here he gets a belt-high fastball. Uh, I mean, he's geared up for it. I think Bello is missing high in the zone too much, and the combined with the familiarity with the Maryland hitters of him, uh, because he's not a total stranger compared to somebody that uh, when you're typically going off of video and scouting reports, it's different when you've seen them, you've hit against somebody, uh, your instincts are more comfortable. The two, a one and one count against Troy Schreffler, who popped out his first time. Now Sam Bellow has the misfortune of having given up four hits so far over Three plus innings of work. Problem is, three of those four hits have ended up on the wrong side of the fence. Here's 2 1. 
Swing and a miss. And then you get moments like that where he's able to throw the change up for a big swing and a miss, tunneling it well with his fastball, with the same sort of arm action. He turns the count to two and two. And Schreffler flicks it foul. And Maryland did not want to lose Sam Bello to transfer. It was just simple. It was about role. He was a very successful closer. Six saves last year. Treffler gets under this and hits it high in the sky. Lasco battling the sun has to backtrack on it. And that's the first out of the inning. Now, Sam Bello, when he came to Rutgers during the offseason, actually was intensely involved in the competition to earn a weekend starting spot. Yeah. He ended up going to some of the other transfers. We saw Nathan Florence and Jared Kolar get those spots, and he's been great as a long reliever, but that's the aim at some point, and he was a starter in high school too. Yeah, he was a great starter, Iona Prep. I'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, but, yeah, going back to the offseason, uh, particularly with the domino effect of – of the COVID year for all the, as we're going to get a mountain visit here from Brendan Monahan with a fastball missing high uh, to Costas. Uh, but the domino effect occurring, uh, he gets stretched out there over a three and eight, uh, a third look at uh, over, turn over. Well, this line. one's cracked well to center. Will Lasco have a play at this? He reaches over. Oh, he brought it back. Ryan Lasco had it in his mitt. Was he able to snag it? No, it's gone. Lasco was right there for a play, almost went over the fence. But it's gone. It's Acosta's home run. It's 4-1. to one. My, my, my. The first pitch after, after a mound visit, and Rutgers is going to make a change. Maryland is seeing the fastball from Bello so well. He knew he had to throw a strike. This is inner half of the plate. Well, let's see Ryan Lasco's ins insane effort. Just skimmed the edge of the mitt. Perhaps, wow. perhaps, yeah. Uh, hard to tell if that's a couple feet, a yard, but uh, a tremendous effort. But. Yeah, I, I think that the plan from Rutgers was that, that he would be a possibility today. Uh, but I think that the staff hoped that Bello would last a little bit longer. Uh, Cinebaldi, of course, a left-hander, and he's just much different uh, than Bello as a changeup. But in this case, it's more out of necessity to try to keep the game close. Uh, look, he's had his good starts this year. Uh, a lot of more limited inning appearances. And in some lopsided games, Rutgers has pounded people. He's, he's been able to stay in, like at Nebraska, throwing five and a third innings when Rutgers had big leads. But uh, I think the goal here for Justin Cinebaldi is to give Rutgers two to three innings, one time through the order, and then Rutgers can piecemeal things to get to their closer. Bobby Smarslack pulls this down the line. It's a foul ball, though. It's two and two. Now, the story for Cinebaldi has just been consistency, something that Steve Owens has talked about. He's got great stuff. He's going to pitch in the Cape Cod League. But it's just getting those five innings of one run ball more consistently. 2-2 you know, two, two curls outside. It's three balls and two strikes. And also, the goal now is to just keep Maryland in the yard. They've got five hits, and four of them have left. Nods at the sign from Andy Axelson. Swing and a miss. And there's the good from Justin Cinebaldi. Great break on the off speed. He's got a strikeout, and there's two gone. Yeah, and remember I said, uh, I think it was right before game one yesterday, is you see the great breaking ball that fool Smars lack. Before game one yesterday, I talked about keeping Maryland in the ballpark. Uh, I expected Rutgers to, to not give up as many home runs as they have, and, uh, and, and this is just a great credit to how prolific a lineup the Terps have top to bottom. Uh, there aren't one or two guys where you would focus on. Uh, they wear you out as a club, uh, just like Rutgers does to teams. And Petrutz tops this right back to Cinebaldi, who sprints it over to first, and that'll end the inning. But I think his changeup has, has shown up. He's mixed it well with his fastball. And uh, the only 
issue he had. Fall behind, Chris Brito, think 1-0, trying to come in with a fastball strike. Brito crushed it, that's it. Leading off with Nick Similo, and he fouls that off, strike one. And Nick Dean, if you've seen his changeup today, and when he's on, like his first two starts of the season, at Baylor, at Campbell, both seven innings, both scoreless, it is sort of like something that the pitching ninja, Rob Friedman, called, I believe it was Noah Syndergaard's sinker, a black magic, black magic sinker. It's got that kind of life on it, truly, where it, it goes from his right hand and just slices off half the plate. Tough to hit. It sounds intimidating. Yeah. <laughs> Hitting the black magic. <laughs> 3 1 to Samillo. That's ball four. So it's the first free pass issued by Dean. You get it in on, on, on their hands, defensive swings, good things happen for you. I almost hit him. Well, that's the, the idea of trying to get inside and avoid results like this. Chris Brito reaching out and grabbing one and hitting another home run against the Terrapins. He swings, he misses, so that ball gets away from Schliger and it allows Samillo to advance to second. So much life on it that Brito missed it and Schliger did too. Uh, but I'd like to see that pitch a little bit more. Uh, and let's see if he doubles up on it. Now Schliger, of course, has got to block it now uh, with a guy in second. They've got to change the signs uh, with Samillo aboard a catcher who's certainly going to know, uh, know things well. Uh, you know, you have the ability to, to read signs better than, you, than the average player. But let's see if he shows the breaking ball and features a little bit more. That's a fastball. It hits the outside corner for strike two. Mm -hmm. That that's a delicious pitch. Uh, Brito, that is, it is in Brito's uh, wheelhouse, and he still planted it there right on the black. I'll see if Dean goes back to the gourmet stuff. A look at second, now a 1-2. And missed it upstairs. But not a bad spot for it. You saw it break from eye level to just above the top of the zone, trying to bait Brito into a two-strike swing. Yeah, I, I like that pitch. Now let's see if he goes breaking ball, inner part of the plate, and tie up Chris. The pitch. It's in the dirt. That's a good block by Schliger that time. Runs the count full, three and two. Rob Vaughn, during the offseason, was watching the MLB draft and hoping that Chris Brito's name would be called. So these kinds of moments would not have to happen this year. Brito just trying to get on, though, as Rutgers looks to come back. Payoff. Uh, foul it back. We'll try it again. Rob still might drive Chris uh, to his <laughs> next destination anyway. <laughs> Chris Brito's numbers, lifetime against Maryland. Seven games, 14 for 28. So he's a 500 hitter. Seven long balls, 17 RBI. And who knows if these two teams will meet again in the postseason. Swing and a miss. Dean went high and tight. Brito got a tiny piece of it. That's what the home plate umpire, Sal Giacomantonio, says. But Schliger did a nice job holding on. It is a strikeout. Yeah, while this fastball is probably not a strike, but it's... So an important first out to the inning with a runner on second. And now Evan Slight comes to the plate. And they throw behind Samillo, who gets back in time. You can see that was choreographed with Shaw coming behind Samillo there. Now, Samillo's not a stolen base threat. He's only tried once this year. But they want to keep him close on something into the outfield. And slight swings through it. 
The advantage that a righty pitcher has against a lefty hitter is that sort of back foot curveball, and he just threw it there, Dean did. Dean slowing the game down a little bit here in the fourth after Samillo got on to start. That missed upstairs. Yeah, Dean, uh, I think, kind of lost his release point there, uh, frustrated with himself. He knows that, that that was not, he did not execute that pitch. So it's a one ball, one strike count against Evan Slade. And the pitch, and it's bounced straight back. Yeah, that was the fastball in the outer part of the plate, slight right on it. Boy, it's impressive just seeing these hitters uh, look for their pitches and uh, try to tee off on it uh, from low angle directly behind home plate. Now we have a unique vantage point right behind the backstop, and you can see the velo from some hard throwers. One, two. That fades low. You can see Nick Dean trying to keep Evan Slight, who's a real smart hitter. Use that adjective. He's a discerning guy, that's for sure. Now it's a 2 2. And that's low and in. So Slight has gotten back in the count. It runs full. Oh, these Rutgers hitters, as Nick Dean has seen, uh, they're, they're just not swinging at bad pitches. You know, neither are the Maryland hitters. Uh, I, I, how often are we saying guys are not really getting themselves out uh, when, when the count is in their favor? The 3 2. We'll try it again. That's part of the reason why yesterday we had more than 700 pitches between the two teams over the two games. Chase pitches are not often chased. So that's been the story this weekend. Dean trying to strike out slight. Instead, this is carried well to right. Schreffler going back right in front of the wall, leaps and grabs it. Slight just missed it. And it's out number two as Nick Samillo advances to third on the long fly ball. Slight was looking for a two-run shot. Sure, the breaking ball. There's no pass ball or wild pitch here. And Dean starts off Santa Maria with strike one. Tony Santa Maria third in the Big Ten in RBI, and he would love one here. The pitch. And Dean a couple of times in this inning has lost his release point. Pitch count's not all that high. He's at 63 right now. He can go 100. And that one loops in. That is exactly what Dean was trying to execute on the pitch before that missed. And he's ahead one and two. And the righty comes home. That dives outside. Yeah, like that slider miss outside just to see if the batter will offer. Uh, now 2-2. Two, two. Uh, like to see if the changeup perhaps return. Haven't seen it in a while. Swing and a miss. Nick Dean has struck out five Scarlet Knights, and he strands a runner 90 feet away with this punch out. This could have been the changeup. Rained all of Friday and Saturday. It was cold and dreary yesterday. Today, nearly 70 and barely a cloud in the sky. Great day for baseball and an important day in the Big Ten. Rutgers and Maryland, the top two teams in the conference. Rutgers wins. They cut their magic number to one to clinch a share of the conference title. With a Maryland win, the Terrapins tie Rutgers in the loss column with two weekends left. And quickly, we see Kevin Keister, Maryland's nine hitter, get in front, 2-0. Justin Cinebaldi, the sophomore southpaws on the hill. 
He's the first reliever out for the Scarlet Knights in his first full inning. As this is tapped slowly down the line, it's a fair ball. No, oh, it's a foul ball. Wow. Home plate umpire Sal Giacomo Antonio called it fair. Third base umpire James Mullick said otherwise. Yeah, Steve Owens is coming out. Oh, instead, it's just strike one. A couple of shakes there from Cinebaldi. Missed low. It's now three balls and a strike. Now Steve Owens also may be trying to back up his team a little bit. You've seen the offense collect one run on two hits thus far. That's ball four. So after the fair foul, foul ball, it's two straight out of the zone, and Kevin Keister works a walk. Can you believe that Keister was not the starting second baseman at the beginning of the year? Uh, and, and watching him play now over a weekend. And uh, he, he had to earn the job, but wow, has he basically put cement. Uh, he has cemented his name at the position at second base uh, in all the different things that he does that, that uh, I, I think aren't just, just about the major offensive categories. Uh, throw over. We saw Cinebaldi with a good move there. And he's trying to keep Keister close. Yeah, he had Keister. Uh, did, Keister didn't recognize it immediately. Had him fooled for a moment. Now, Keister is one of several guys on this team, though, who are having breakout years after subpar or just bad years last year. It's tough to call last year bad for Keister. He was just a freshman. It's a tough adjustment in an all Big Ten season. But he hit just 0.98. He was 4 for 41. He's had several four-hit games this year. He had four all of last season. And so his development has been important, one of several guys in breakout years, to get Maryland to this point where they've now broken the program record for regular season wins. Yeah, I'd say the guy at the plate, too, in, in Schliger to be the full-time starting catcher and be a leadoff guy surpassed their expectations uh, in terms of to what degree how to what degree of an offense they would have. After the mound visit, Cinebaldi throws the curveball low. Now he started this inning with six of seven pitches missing the zone. And this is the point in the ball game where the game teeters, where the score teeters. Maryland by three, a swing, and they go up by five. And you start to salt the game away. At least you see your path to getting out of this, even against a Rutgers offense that has shown the ability to come back. Now that's the value of moments like this, even with Rutgers still having five more chances at the plate. Yeah, this game is a long way from over. Uh, I, I think even yesterday, Rutgers uh, winning by 10 didn't feel the game was comfortably over. Uh, there was a point that they were warming up their closer, Dale Stanovich, for a moment. Uh, I think, Dom, it was in the sixth inning after a, a Max Costas double made it, made it 13 to 5, uh, somewhere around there, or the seventh, where the score is, or, or, or when Sam Portnoy came in, uh, where it was 14 to 6, and there were a couple of runners on, and Rutgers is thinking about warming up their closer because uh, uh, in college baseball, in the majors, it feels like a lot, but with the home run ball in college baseball, it's not. 3-1 is tap foul. Schlager swinging there. That runs the count full. And we saw Rutgers rally from a huge deficit in the Ohio State series last weekend. This team will always draw on the Indiana series, where it rallied from three deficits after seven innings to win all three of those games. But Maryland looking to add to the lead. As this one is hit down the right field line, fair, bouncing towards the corner. Good start for Keister. He's already to third, but he's going to stop right there. Luke Schliger has his first hit of the day. It's a double. Two in scoring position for the Terrapins to start the fifth. Man, and he takes a 3-2 pitch, a couple foul balls. Uh, again, another guy that j does not give in a control that bat. Chris Ali. It's an inner part of the plate fastball uh, that he is just able to golf. 
And uh, Steve Owens is going to come out, I think, make another pitching change. Uh, well, Stanovich comes in, and the first batter is Chris Aline, who switches around to the right side to bat against the lefty. He's got Kevin Keister at third, Luke Schliger at second, and the Rutgers infield is in. And the first pitch is tap foul. It was the slider. Strike one. Now Stanovich has on several occasions this year gone multiple innings. He's not the typical one-inning closer. But his primary job, forget about throwing three innings, he's got to put out the fire here. The strike one pitch. That misses inside. And the fact is that uh, the most important outs of a game, and a lot of times, are not are not in the top or the bottom of the ninth. Uh, it is right here for Rutgers to try to keep the game close, keep this lead from mushrooming. One one. That's the same spot. The fastball runs in. Two and one. As you mentioned, Ralph, Stanovich is one of Rutgers' leaders in strikeouts. Averages about three Ks every two innings, and he would love one here. The pitch. That bends low. And now what does Stanovich do here on three and one with a base open, but Nick LaRusso, who has hurt Rutgers in the series, but is 0 for 2 today, waiting on deck. I think you've got a crowd of lean uh, in on his hands. He's tried a couple of pitches. Uh, I, I think that uh, that's the approach. It'll be a 3-1. And this one's hit well to right center. Lasco still sprinting, makes the catch coming onto the warning track. It'll score a run as Keister is in. Luke Schliger advances to third. Chris Aline collects yet another RBI. And Maryland adds one. It's 5-1 to one with a chance to get one more. A runner on third, less than two outs. Yeah, that was a fastball in the outer part of the plate. Uh, actually, it's kind of more high. Uh, but Aline, who homered twice yesterday as a left-hand batter, he's the lone switch hitter the reg among the regulars in the Maryland lineup. And it still shows you pretty good power. And he knew if I get the ball to up in the air in the outfield, it scores a run. And now LaRusso. Infield stays in here, and there's strike one. Nice way to start the at-bat. LaRusso has a fly out to left and a pop out on the infield. The strike one pitch, and LaRusso chases. That was low and away, nothing in two. Yeah, that's very unlike Nick LaRusso, and uh, perhaps part of that is I think he thought the first pitch was out of the zone, and then Dale extended on the 0-1 pitch, and LaRusso, by the time he realized that the ball was tailing away, it was too late. He had already started his swing mechanics. Sandovich trying to put away LaRusso, and he fouls off the fastball. And I think LaRusso realizes they are uh, pitching him well away. Now let's see if Stanovich tries to jam him inside in 0-2. Another two-strike pitch from the lefty. Strike three. Top of the zone, he froze Nick LaRusso. Two gone on the fifth. Yeah, significant strikeout, all set up by the first two pitches. Now batting, the short stop, number six, Matt Shaw. You get a great look at it from this vantage point. Yeah, that looks to be belt high. And, uh, and, and LaRusso just was, uh, everything was set up and he was looking for something completely different. Now Matt Shaw. Takes a big rip and miss. Nothing in one. 
Matt Shaw is one of the four home run hitters today for Maryland. His came in the fourth inning. All four home runs have been of the solo variety. Swing and a miss. That's the story with Stanovich when he's rocking. Yeah, that as was you said, it, it's not a lot of strikeouts looking like Larusso had. Yeah, it, uh, he's in attack mode now because he knows he has two outs. He was trying to get Larusso to get himself out uh, in the last at bat. Now an 0-2. Now I think he bears down looking for a strikeout. The pitch. And he spiked it. You can see he lost the follow through as he fell off the mound. Now it's one ball and two strikes. Stanovich trying to strand Luke Schliger at third. Here comes the one two. And it's popped high in the sky down the line and it curls foul. Good spoil there by Shaw with two strikes. These are high pressure pitches, high pressure at bats for both teams. Another one, two. And blocked by, by Axelson. As that slider dipped down into the turf. So Stanovich got quickly ahead, nothing in two, but now Shaw has battled back to even up the count. Stanovich's pitch. Shaw started but pulled back, and now it's a full count. Shaw gets on, it's Troy Schreffler due up. Hitless today, but he was productive in the double header yesterday with two hits in each game. The payoff. Just missed, it's ball four. What a plate appearance by Matt Shaw. Behind nothing in two on one of the Big Ten's top closers, and he works a walk. I was about to say that, that a, a very dangerous, the, the 3 2 high fastball from Stanovich could be very dangerous. He tried to go kind of low and away, plant the fastball, and yeah, that's, that's too low. And out of the zone, it is a great at bat from Sean. And now we'll see first and third. Do they send Shaw here? And there's a lefty on the mound. It's Schreffler at the plate, squares to Bunce, and Axelson keeps it right there at the plate. Ball one. Yeah, I think that was just a show, just to see, to see how Rutgers handles it. This is a Maryland team that has shown its ability to work small ball effectively, to score runs off of it, but that would be something. The one ball pitch. And now Stanovich has thrown five straight out of the zone. He falls behind Schreffler 2-0. Oh. Trying to avoid further damage in the fifth. There's a strike. Treffler today has popped out to third and flied out to center. It's Schliger at third. And Shaw at first. As this one sliced foul. So back to a two strike count. Maryland has added a run in the inning, but looking for more, looking to extend the lead. 
in a battle of the Big Ten's top two offenses. Sandovich's pitch. It's a slow chopper to short. DiGiorgio comes in, makes it look smooth, and throws to first. It's the benefit of having a great defense. Danny DiGiorgio gets Scheffler out at first, and it'll end the inning. But Stanovich does allow one of the two inherited runners to score. Maryland scores a run for the fourth straight inning. And he's shown all four of his pitches just to keep you a little off balance. That'll be the bottom third of the Rutgers order here. Josh Kuroda Grauer, Richie Schiekoffer, and Andy Axelson. As Kuroda Grauer hits this high in the sky, deep right center field, Rutgers looks to start the comeback. Josh Kuroda Grauer leaves the building. Five to two, Terrapins. And beyond that, uh, beyond that, uh, I can't imagine putting in a freshman pitcher against either one of these lineups. You would not. Uh, if you are a freshman pitcher, it is someone that could have been drafted in the top 10 rounds of the draft last year. You just happen to be here. Andy Axelson at the plate. Breaking ball dives out of the zone. Look good, but it's one and one. And now Axelson goes down and get it. And it. Hangs up as a lean cuts over to the alley. And makes the catch to gone. Moving their lineup around on the weekend and it's paid off. As Ryan Lasko comes to the plate and swings through the off speed. I like Monday afternoon baseball. It's a standalone yeah, game. Yeah. More eyes on it, that's for sure. Also helps that it's nearly 70 degrees and barely of cloudy. Course, of course. The pitch. Alasco chops it foul. Yeah, maybe a random Monday afternoon for this game. Push back two days because of all the rain in the area, but it is meaningful. One two from Dean. And I lost the control of the fastball. Uh, get credit both teams, the Big Ten, of course, uh, the players for rearranging their lives. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if, if classes are still going if you're in study week yet, uh, but to make this happen, uh, because there's a lot of conferences, uh, for example, that only play double headers on Sunday, and that's it. Uh, St. John Seton Hall. Uh, washed out Friday, Saturday, only played two on Sunday, uh, not playing today. Uh, but the Big Ten recognizes the significance of this game uh, and this matchup, and both teams recognize that it's significant, that hey, uh, uh, even if we lose, uh, we'd rather play, even with a possibility we might lose because there is so much to gain here with a victory. Lasko's run the count full, and he takes, oh, he got hit actually. In any event, he's gonna take first base. So Lasko gets aboard for the first time after two ground outs to start his afternoon. Elite in the second game yesterday that Rutgers, Rutgers won, but so far today they have been held quiet. That's funny, you flip the lineup card to yesterday and you've got 11 runs scored. Four home runs between the top three, Lasco to Giorgio Similo. So far today, it's five outs, a walk and a hit by pitch. And it's a credit to Nick Dean. And throws over at Lasco, who is a threat to go, but he's back in. Let's see if Rutgers tries to cook something up here with two outs and a high contact guy into Giorgio at the plate. Long hold for Dean. And you can see him trying to mess with the timing over there of Lasko. Uh, 
Pasco inching off first a little more. The pitch. And it's low for ball one. I think part of why neither team has done much running is because how prolific the offenses are, the way the ball has gone out, uh, too. You just don't want to eliminate uh, base runners and have anybody thrown out and potentially extinguish big innings. 1-1. One, one. And now Dean has struggled with his control a little bit. It's two balls and a strike to DiGiorgio. Now worth mentioning, his pitch count is starting to get up there. He just threw his 85th pitch. It was three economical innings to start, but the last two, the fourth and now the fifth, have been lengthy. As DiGiorgio pulls this down the line, but it's well foul. Right on cue with Dean's pitch count getting up there. You look down the first baseline in the Maryland bullpen, their closer, Sean Hine, is getting warmed up. He's their best reliever. Dean is ready and now throws over on Lasco again. Lasco, by the way, is 8 for 9 on stolen base attempts this year. And there is Hine. 2-2. Two -two. And DiGiorgio drives it foul the other way. That's quite telling uh, as well with a 3-1 lead that, that Hine is throwing at this point. Uh, each coach is trying to buy time to move to Stanovich in, in the fifth inning by Steve Owens. Uh, Hine potentially who could also throw multiple innings too. Strike three on the outside corner. Once again, Nick Dean, like an artist, paints the corner. A, an ex-teammate of theirs has to contribute to it. And all four of the home runs came off of Rutgers starter Sam Bellow. First career start, only able to go three and a third innings. Responsible for four of the five runs. Dale Stanovich is on the hill for another inning of work as Maxwell Costas, one of those home run hitters, is at the plate. Now Stanovich is Rutgers' closer, came in with two runners in scoring position and nobody out in the fifth, allowed one of those two guys to score. He's about to throw his 24th pitch. And Costas tries to check, but the home plate umpire says he went around. One and two. Now Stanovich called upon to pitch his second inning. You figure he's got at least 40 pitches in him today, all told. The one-two. And Costas puts it into foul play. Brito looking for it, but doesn't have a chance. For Dale Stanovich, 21 pitches um, in that first inning. His season high is 44 thrown at Nebraska-Omaha where he threw three innings. That's his season high. I, I think that's possible today uh, because of the magnitude of today's game. The one-two. Costas hits this well and it's in the left field for a hit. In a series where Costas has not been the most boisterous Terrapin hitter, comes through now with a home run and a single in back-to-back -back plate appearances. And at the very least, even if the Terrapins don't score here, your goal is to get Dale Stanovich out of the game as quickly as possible, and they've been able to extend some long at-bats against him already. Yeah, oh my, if, if that happens, uh, uh, again, uh, what a difference maker that is. Uh, but for Steve Owens, he felt if we fall further behind, uh, the game's over anyway. So he, ha he had to do it here rather than wait until the late innings. Uh, because then uh, you've run out of time. And, and the, same, the same for Maryland's Rob Vaughn with Sean Hine. I think it's possible we, we could see Hine uh, throw the bottom of the sixth and seventh.
Bobby Smarzlak at the plate. Yeah, Stanovich misses arm side away, ball one. Now Stanovich is one of the top closers in the Big Ten, but also one of the best in the country. Started the season on the National Stopper of the Year watch list. Certainly in the running among the nation leaders in saves. Top 10 with 10. And Axelson had that in his mitt. Unfortunately, he's able to freeze Costas just long enough to scramble for it. But it is a two ball count. Yeah, I don't think Costas is going anywhere. He's not really a stolen base threat and not the leadoff guy here. Uh, you're taking the bat out of the hands of Zmarslak. In this series, I don't discount anything. Even Maxwell Costas trying to take second. As Smarslak hits this really well, the left center field. Lasco makes a running catch onto the warning track. We've seen five combined home runs and five more almost home runs today, and that was one of them. Yeah, even a lot of the Maryland outs, too, are, are, are just solid hits. I mean, uh, and Lasco just glides and just plays such a, a pro center field. Covers so much territory. You know, I wish the Big Ten would come out with you know Gold Glove Award winners uh, for each position. I think I would love to see some college conferences do that. Uh, why not? Uh, he would probably get the bulk of the votes out of the Big Ten. Now strike one to Ian Petrutz. If it wouldn't be Lasco, it would most likely be his counterpart, Chris Aline. Yeah. You've got two head coaches who both say that their center fielder is the best defensive center fielder in the Big Ten. Pitch. And it hit him. Uh, Petrutz is the first lefty that Stanovich is facing here. And he plunks him on the second pitch of the at-bat. So that puts two guys on with one out. And the pesky and powerful nine-hitter Kevin Keister coming up. Yeah, that, that, this is unlike Dale. That goes a slider low and into him. Only his third hit batter of the season in 24 and two thirds innings. So here's Keister, another big spot. Rutgers just scored one in the bottom of the fifth, and Maryland looking to return serve once more. They've scored in the last four innings. Double play depth for the Rutgers infield. As that pitch is spiked by Stanovich. 1-0. So yeah, you have some options here with the way Keister can lay down a bunt or hit and run. Brendan Monahan is uh, showing concern because these uh, at least three of like, the last five pitches thrown by Stanovich have been low. Two guys who have had a lot of success this year, Jared Kolar and Nathan Florence, did not have it. Neither of them pitched into the third inning. So they've had to use a lot of arms. Back to action as Keister hits it off of Santa Maria's mitt into left field. Costas turns around third, he scores! Maryland goes back in front by four. Tony Santamaria almost had the hot shot from Kevin Keister, but it knocked off of his mitt, and the Terrapins grab the run right back. Uh, Tony is as good as it gets as a defensive third base in college baseball. He makes tons of diving plays. Look at this great job by our crew. Uh, Keister was expecting a fastball on 1-0, to be a strike. Uh, his high baseball IQ uh, played into that. He knew that Stanovich had to come in and get even and not fall behind. He was sitting on a fastball and ripped it. The runners on first and second for Maryland now is Luke Schliggers to the plate. And there's strike one on the outside corner. Schliger today has a double and has been hit by a pitch and three times at the plate. And then after him, it's Chris Aline. It would be Stanovich's second time through the Maryland order. And only the fourth earned run allowed this season by Stanovich over his 24 and a third innings pitched. Uh, he has been uh, so good for Rutgers. And uh, while Rutgers has had a lot of lopsided games, you look at the games that he has saved, it's been a lot of close one. Of course, it has to be a close one, but uh, sometimes some saves are not, or have a much higher degree of difficulty than others. And Dale has had uh, at least a handful that I can point to that, that, were, that were significant. 
That's two balls and a strike against Schliger. And a fastball dots the outer edge, two and two. That's a couple of pitches on the edge of the zone to get strikes in this count, in this at bat. And so the count is two and two. As this is hit to DiGiorgio, who dives, grabs it, and flips to second. One of the most remarkable double plays you'll see in baseball this year. DiGiorgio dives to his left, takes it off the turf, and with his mitt, flipped it to Josh Carota Grauer to turn two. Unreal. This is special, and even with Todd Frazier in the building here at Bainton Field watching, the Giorgio shows how quality he is. The Dean at 88 pitches with Maryland's top reliever, Sean Hine, warming up given a chance to at least start the inning as he starts out Samilla with strike one. I like the decision to keep Nick Dean going here. Every out that he gets is one that someone not named Sean Hine has to get from Maryland to try to get to the, to get to the finish line. One, one. And Samillo sent down to a knee, strike two. And he's got the curveball changeup. He's got four pitches, third time through the order. Uh, let's see if he shows even a different sequence, different variety. And Samillo chases, strike three. And now Chris Brito. That's ball one. Brito today has homered and struck out. Top of the zone strike. Great movement on that one. Now Nick Dean is somebody that the Terrapin coaching staff has worked with extensively this year. It's the reason why he was moved back from being the Friday guy, as he was most of the year, to the Sunday guy, or the Game 3 guy now for the second weekend series. They wanted to make some changes mechanically. Now, we talked about how he had the great outings to start the year at Baylor and Campbell, but then had a lull, a middle point of the season of just mediocre for a guy who's an elite starter. And there's ball four. But the book's still out with Evan Slight at the plate now and a runner on as Brito works the walk. Strike one. And it's similar to what they did with Jason Savakul, where last year, first half of 2021, Savakul was borderline elite but he wore down, he got tired. Uh, so they added agility uh, to him, made it be a little bit more explosive. It's fascinating what they're able to do, uh, these fully funded programs that have access to not just strength and conditioning coaches, but uh, the video work, uh, all the player development stuff uh, uh, that, that, that transforms players that, are already have, that already have talent but maximizes their potential. Now that was the 100th pitch for Nick Dean, and it Missed outside, two and one. Now the reason why that, beyond the fact that they wanted to move him back and take the pressure off of him, they also wanted to give him a chance to get more pitches during his side session during the week last week, leading into the Northwestern series. Two, one, and there's the changeup, wow. That is Dean at his best on pitch 101. Now Dean got 20 or so pitches in the pen to really work out the the fine details of moving to the plate quickly. And you can see it in this, as his 2-2 is cut on and missed. Nick Dean with two strikeouts in the sixth inning. He's over 100 pitches, not tiring. It's not enough. That changeup certainly not slowing down. And uh, reemphasizes why Maryland is such a threat to get to a super regional. Uh, because if, if this is either your first or third starter, uh, a lot of those programs are, are, are going to be in trouble once you get to the number three spot. And they've had weekends where their starting pitchers have combined to all throw uh, like 21 innings. 
That was the story last weekend against Northwestern. 21 scoreless innings between the three starting pitchers. Dean is ahead. No balls and two strikes on Tony Santa Maria, who has already gone down on strikes twice against Dean. Looking to cap off six strong. The 0-2. Chase and a miss. Put it down to the turf. Santa Maria chase strike three. Nick Dean, nine strikeouts and a quality start. It was a series circled on the Big Ten calendar, Rutgers and Maryland, and it has played out that way. The top two teams in the Big Ten playing their rubber match today. You see Rutgers atop the conference. Maryland, four back in the win column, but just one back in the loss column. If this result holds, Maryland would pull even in that column with Rutgers taking the Big Ten week off next weekend and Maryland having to play a tough series against Michigan. And as we start the seventh inning, it's Rutgers closer Dale Stanovich back out there for a third inning of work. The Terrapins already in front by four. Yep, 44 is his season high pitches coming in. About to throw number 39. Uh, but guys in NCAA regionals, super regionals, they get stretched out because uh, the magnitude is there. Uh, so I'm sure this is nothing that Dal Stanovich can handle and, uh, and I think embraces because uh, he's got to hold the line here for his team to keep it at four. And with Rutgers offense, four is not insurmountable. Four is kind of a, a walk, a hit batter, you know, and they could hit a couple of home runs uh, in a, in a five-minute span. Stanovich is in danger of putting Chris Aline on. It's a 3-0 and oh count. And it's a fastball down the chute. You can see Aline started his path to first base, but instead he's got to climb back into the righty batter's box. Outer edge, top of the zone. Sal Giacomo Antonio says it hit the corner as Aline pulls it foul. And in terms of context for Dale Stanovich, Dom, uh, his career high innings is three and a third in his very first career appearance last year uh, in Minneapolis against Indiana to open up uh, the Big Ten season last year. He's worked the count full three and two. And Aline spoils it. Now they don't have the pitches thrown from that appearance over three and a third. So for the sake of argument, his career high in pitches was 44 set earlier this season that he is about to pass. Aline pops it up on the diamond. DiGiorgio called off by the freshman Kuroda Grauer who lost it and now dives for it. An adventurous pop out to start the seventh inning. Yeah, great job there by Josh. And that ball had so much spin. Uh, <laughs> kind of having a laugh to himself. Uh, you always want to have infielders in position to kind of back up. When it's, when, it's that, it when it's that close, you always want to have the second infielder kind of in position where if it, if it kind of is, starts to tail away, you have another guy ready for it. That's, that's uh, easier said than done. Now you can laugh about it once it ends up in the webbing of your mitt. Russo swings and misses. He's had a couple of plate appearances now where he's chased some. This is his second chance against Stanovich. He chased in his first at bat against Stanovich back in the fifth and struck out. And the lefties ahead again, nothing in two. The pitch. That's high and tight. Stanovich shanks the first sign from Axelson. Now set. Swing and a miss. Top of the zone there from Stanovich. He picks up his second strikeout of this long relief outing. And he gets two outs for the best part of the Terrapin order. I think regardless of how this game finishes up, uh, 
Uh, if Rutgers didn't know for sure, now they know that they can turn to Dale Stanovich in the middle of the innings against high level competition, and he's going to want the ball for three innings. He's a whenever, wherever sort of guy. Now Matt Shaw, the cleanup hitter. And that one just dipped low and in, ball one. Now you can see he's one of a couple pitchers we've witnessed this weekend who pitch with an intensity. That 1 0 dots the outer edge. Not losing his command. He's north of 50 pitches now. Just through his 51st. Now, it helps too with Stanovich is. He's got what scouts would call a repeatable delivery. He's an athletic pitcher, a guy who can dunk, despite the fact that he's not six feet tall. Two and one. When you're one of 10 kids, uh, you grow up playing every sport imaginable. I bet you he can hit a right-handed layup with his right hand too. Younger sister, Jackie Stanovich, <laughs> plays college basketball at Mercy College. 2-1 on the inside corner now. Stanovich spotting it up in his third inning. Now Maryland has scored in the last five frames. Stanovich trying to finally stop the scoring. The 2-2. It's hit hard on the ground to Kuroda Grauer, who gobbles it up. And it's a 1-2-3 inning. Brilliant work from Dale Stanovich here. Three innings in the middle of this ball game to try to give Rutgers a chance. 17 walks, not bad. And uh, this is also a multiple inning performance uh, slated for him. A pitch to Josh Crow to Grauer is tapped slowly back to Hine, who gives up to the catcher, and Schliger makes the play. As Crow to Grauer is retired for the first time today. And now Richie Schiekoffer's at the plate. Now worth mentioning too with Sean Hine in the game, that means the end of the line for Nick Dean, Maryland's starter, who was really good. Uh, Dean with nine strikeouts, two runs, three hits, six innings. I think his, a great line. I think his pitching mix was excellent. Season high, nine strikeouts. Uh, and, and, he, and he was able to pick up three strikeouts in his last inning of work to show you his full pitch mix there. Three hits, the, uh, the solo home run early to Chris Brito, and then one to Josh Carota Brower, both off the fastball. He limited the free passes. Maryland. But this is a fifth year senior that you know, has given you great at bats. He dominated Division Three at Ithaca and has had a, a nice season here at Rutgers, uh, being a platoon DH, 276, couple of home runs. The strike one pitch, and Hine missed it outside. Well, the other thing too is, you want to extend from this nine hitter back to the top of the order. Last go to Giorgio and Samillo, three of the Big Ten's best. Rutgers trying to start a rally for the first time today. 1-1 uh, one, one runs way inside. What does Callahan look for here ahead in the count? Hines pitch. That's up and away. He's had some trouble spotting them. In fact, he's only put two pitches in the zone so far, and one of them was the ground out to Kuroda Grauer. Ryan Lasko waiting on deck. The pitch. Callahan takes, ball four. 
So uh, he's a workhorse. Uh, he's got the frame and the ability to do it as a guy that could have been a midweek starter uh, when he was recruited to the program. That's the national hitter of the week, Ryan Lasko at the plate. And Falco misses away for ball one. Lasko today does not have a hit. You see the ground outs has been hit by a pitch. Over his last seven games, he's hitting 583 with 13 extra base hits. And looking for a 14th. And instead he taps it slowly back to Falco, who looks at second and throws to first. Gets the certain out. There's two away as the runners advance. She offered a third and Callahan to second. Yeah, I, uh, don't be greedy. Just take the safe out. And Danny DiGiorgio. And again, Falco misses outside. Yeah, in that case, the out is more valuable. And, and remember, you're still Maryland. You still have an offense, too, that <laughs> the opponent has to get you out six more times. And it's probably not going to be Stanovich. No, true. Dale Stanovich, 54 pitches. And Maryland leading the home run battle right now, 4-2 to two on the day. The pitch two to Giorgio on the outside corner. That's a good spot for it, one and one. The Giorgio looking for his first hit of the day, trying to extend a 28-game on base streak. One, one. And again, the miss for Falco is on his glove side, trying to stay away from the top two hitters in the order here. Big moment in the bottom of the seventh as Rutgers looks to rally. 2-1. And Giorgio slices it foul. Late on the fastball. Yeah, it's a good cut from DiGiorgio. Uh, Falco's going to come at you. Let's see what kind of secondary stuff he has. Rutgers trying to drive two in, in scoring position. Merlin trying to preserve the four-run lead. Falco's pitch. It's sliced down the right field line. Schreffler cutting the line. It drops in. One run is in. Now Callahan behind him scores as well. The super senior Danny DiGiorgio comes through when Rutgers needs it badly. It's a two-run single. It cuts the Maryland lead in half. Well, if Rutgers comes back to win this, win this game, there might be a game-winning hit elsewhere, but the reason they win is because of this. And now Samillo represents the tying run as he fouls it off the other way. DiGiorgio's first hit of the afternoon. And Nick Samillo here looking for the same thing. And DiGiorgio, Rutgers leader in stolen bases, gets a check at first. A one. It's on the inside corner, and now Falco ahead 0 and 2. The right hander set at the belt. And again, misses away. Here comes the 1-2. And Samillo pulls his hands in out to center field. It's in front of a lean for a hit. DiGiorgio all the way to third. Great base running by Danny DiGiorgio to, to go first to third. Nick Samillo has his first hit of the afternoon. The game tying runs are on the bases for the Knights in this seventh inning rally. And now very dangerous here for Falco as he has to try to get ahead of Brito. And it's Chris Burrito at the plate, a guy who has thrived against the Terrapins over the last two years and has thrived this year. 
The Big Ten leader in RBI with 63, and he's got the tying runs on the pond here. Falco ahead, nothing and one. And the pitch. That just missed. That's the borderline call that can change a plate appearance, and you could see it from the reaction by Falco and Schliger. Now a 1 1. That missed low. This is a Rutgers team that has a history of huge rallies in series finales. Rallied from a five-run deficit Sunday at Ohio State. Turn an 8-3 deficit into an 11-8 win. As Burrito pops this up, it's going to get out of play. I think also about the game on Easter Sunday here. A game in which Indiana jumped out to a 4-0 lead early on, but Rutgers walked it off on Jordan Sweeney's home run in the bottom of the ninth. Maryland trying to avoid that, looking to win the series. David Falco's 2-2. And Burrito jammed, rolls it slowly to short. Shaw throws to first, inning over. But Rutgers grabs two runs back. They cut the Maryland lead down 2-2. Uh, Danny DiGiorgio's two-run single out to right. Big spot for the senior, he came through. And in the eighth inning of a two-run game, it's a redshirt freshman on the hill and a true freshman behind the plate. And it's his junior, Troy Schreffler, at the plate to start it out for the Terrapins. He's ahead 1-0. Schreffler, then Maxwell Costas and Bobby Smarslack do up. The Terrapins with the win. Ty Rutgers in the loss column with two weekends to go in the Big Ten. Here's strike one. And it looks like Portnoy is A-OK -okay after getting hit by a line drive on the kind of the outside of the right knee yesterday uh, by Troy Schreffler, the first batter he faces yesterday and today. That's rolled over to third. Santa Maria gobbles it up. That's a low throw, and Burrito can't scoop it. Safe at first. Schreffler is aboard, and it's going to be an error to start out the eighth. Yeah, you get a good hitter to roll over like that, and that is unlike Tony Santa Maria. Uh, it, it was almost too routine for him. It has to be a throwing error. So Tani, uh, Tony Santamaria, that is, picks up his error there. It's a team leading error. And now Maxwell Costas is at the plate. He's two for three today with a home run. And he gets under this one, drives it high in the sky. Lasco, still drifting, makes the catch. Now Costas has one of the four Maryland home runs today. He hit one in the fourth, along with Shaw, two batters before him. Smarslack also in the second, and Keister in the third. And Maryland has used the same lineup in all three games of this series. Seven of the nine hitters have hit home runs. Mm -hmm. that, that's one of the many amazing stats of this weekend, huh? The other one I love to research, Dom, is how many out of the walks issued scored this weekend, and what percentage? it might be like 75%, and that might put that argument to bed. You know how coaches will make up and say, well, if the leadoff walk scores 99% of the time. <laughs> well, how about just the walks in general in this series? Just like in the last inning, Callahan and Sheikoffer walk. What happens? They both end up scoring. Well, Portnoy is ahead. Nothing in two on Smarslack. That home run is only hit today. The pitch. Chase and miss. Portnoy goes downstairs and collects a strikeout. Not a ton of Ks for the Rutgers pitching staff today. There have been a whole bunch of balls put in play into the outfield by the Terrapins, but there are two outs in the eighth. Yeah, especially on 0-2, and he has a, a, a quality hitter, a hitter just looking baffled, not seeing the ball out of the hand. And now it's another freshman, Ian Petrutz, at the plate. 
And Portnoy hits the outer edge for strike one. And Sam Portnoy has only been pitching this style for a year. And just imagine what he's going to come back and look like uh, next year. And he's a converted traditional over-the-shoulder thrower. And now he's a strike away from posting a shutdown inning after Rutgers scored two runs in the bottom of the seventh. Maryland scored in the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth. It is tough to beat teams that can do that. But Rutgers has a chance. The 0-2. It's hit the other way. Santa Maria, great field on the short hop and a cleaner throw. That ends the inning. So Portnoy works around the inning starting error. We go to the bottom of the eighth. The Scarlet Knight bats come back to the plate. Maryland by two. This game has lived up to the hype of number one versus number two. A pitch to slight. That settles in for strike one. Yeah, I think it's kind of appropriate after having uh, two games that ended up uh, being lopsided scores. We figured one of them would be a, a pretty competitive one that would kind of be the rubber match. Uh, when you have uh, two very good teams that appear to be very even, particularly offensively, and here we are. Uh, by comparison, this has been a pitcher's duel. Maryland won with 16 runs. Rutgers with 17 runs yesterday. A slight punches it foul the other way. And I think it makes you appreciate just how good Ryan Ramsey is of Maryland. Six innings, two hits uh, yesterday, um, along with Dean. Uh, because when you look at when other pitchers are throwing on e e either side, what the offenses can do with them. Falco's ahead one and two. And Slight taps it slowly to first. Costas is there. Falco's got a cover. And he beats Slight to the bag for out number one. Yeah, big first out. Uh, he was not as big as he is now. Uh, Dad was a lineman at, uh, at Cortland off the top of my head. Yep. So might have even uh, crossed paths uh, maybe with Steve Owens. Yeah, Steve Owens at SUNY Cortland for a while, one of his four stops. A one to Santa Maria. Quickly, nothing in two. Now, Tony has struck out three times today. Well, this is his first time facing Falco. All three Ks were against Nick Dean. Here's the pitch. And that just missed. Same spot as the last one, or at least same vicinity but not the same call from Sal Giacomo Antonio, home plate umpire. That'll be a one-two. That's low and away. Rutgers just trying to get somebody on here to bring the tying run to the plate in a lineup where one through nine, you've got power. Now a two-two. And this is punched to the right side, but Keister is there. And two outs on the ground for David Falco after struggling a bit in the seventh inning. Allowed the two inherited runners to score that were in the end charged to Sean Hine. He's got two up, two down so far in the eighth. Yeah, I think most significant is that he kept the ball on the ground. Uh, when these Rutgers hitters can elevate and swing through the ball with a little bit of elevation, it goes a long way. Now Josh Corotta Grauer, who has one of the two Rutgers home runs. Productive day for the freshman. The pitch. Again, Falco finds the outer corner. Now here's a look at what we saw from Corotta Grauer back in the fifth inning. Little spark that Rutgers may have needed. Now 0-2 and missed away. Yeah, now two straight strikes and then a miss once again. And that was a fastball down the middle that Dean missed with. And this series has shown if if pitchers make mistakes to these guys, 
high percentage chance they, they will crush it. It's been the same sequence here for Falco as it was to Santa Maria. Got ahead, nothing in two, and then missed sort of middle away and now low and away. And what's the result on now two and two? Looking for the scoreless bottom of the eighth. The pitch. It's hit well on the ground is short. Shaw scoops it up. High throw, but Costas holds the bag. A 1-2-3 inning for David Falco, who now has retired four and a row. He sends his Terrapins to the ninth with a two-run lead. Maryland looking for a massive series win on the road in Jersey. They position themselves well. And, and if they can hold it off here, what an impressive two out of three it would be for the Terps. Uh, to continue to help out their NCAA resume and, and just taking a look around at the hosting uh, situation for Super Regionals. Of course, there are 16 Super Regional host sites. And uh, based on the experts in the media that, that follow this and track it, the final few host spots are still up in the air. And Maryland, who had started the day with an RPI of 21 uh, on Warren Nolan, after bumping down from, what, 24 yesterday after beating Rutgers or getting a split. Uh, I think if they hold on here, that number might be, you know, 18 or 19. And you're within striking distance. That's a four-pitch walk to start the inning. Wow. Sam Portnoy back on the hill for a second inning. Came in in the eighth. Went scoreless. But Kevin Keister, the nine hitter, now takes four straight out of the zone and not the way that Portnoy seven. wanted to start the ninth. Schliger. With Schliger, Aline, LaRusso due up after. I'm going to make a prediction that Kevin Keister never loses a second base job the rest of his career. <laughs> uh, With what we've seen this weekend, I mean, even today, two hits, two walks. And to set the tone to lead off against Portnoy, who had baffled four Maryland hitters uh, in the eighth inning, uh, as he did yesterday, uh, giving up just two hits and some weak contact. Uh, he doesn't swing on uh, swing at any pitch that wasn't close in the zone. Didn't offer. Made made Portnoy give in, throw a strike. He didn't. And Schliger pulls it wide of the bag. It's strike two against the Maryland leadoff hitter. Uh, Portnoy, maybe because it's the sidewind delivery that's a bit less strenuous, not as hard to throw, or is a guy who's normal three quarters and 95 of the fastball. Uh, whatever it is, he's been able to come back and give Rutgers quality pitching at a time when they need it badly. The 0-2 misses outside. Now Rutgers got three and a third from Sam Bello. making his first career start and doing it against his old team. Justin Cinebaldi got only two outs, and then the Rutgers closer, Dale Stanovich, pitched three innings. As this one's nubbed slowly back to the mound. To second, it's over to Giorgio, and it's in his center field. Sam Portnoy airmailed it, and Kevin Keister ends up on third. It could have been two, but pitcher's not accustomed to throwing to second. And even with the six foot four to Giorgio leaping as high as he could, he couldn't keep it on the infield. And now on the error, Maryland has runners on the corners with nobody out and a chance for insurance in the ninth. Uh, you said it, Dom. Uh, uh, look, it's just you're not a conventional thrower, and then you kind of find yourself caught in between. Do I throw it as if I'm pitching it to second, or do I throw it overhand like traditional baseball? And I think Sam Courtnoy got caught in, got caught a little bit in between. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, how quickly you have to turn that to start a 1-6-3 double play. All of that forced him to speed up the throw. It's just hard luck. I'm sure they've practiced it many, many times uh, for Sam to make sure that that is not a weakness, but it's just different in game situations. Well, this would not be a bunting situation for Elaine, but I think this is also how to a pitch to Elaine, who's going to be looking for a breaking stuff coming in towards his hands as a left-handed batter. And also, Rutgers is going to bring the infield in. Yep, infield in, runners on the corners. Elaine 
who has shown his pop from this side of the plate, the left side, a switch hitter. It's ball one. And the Scarlet Knight warming up in the bullpen is Wyatt Parliament, the freshman who has not pitched in a Big Ten game and has been the midweek starter. 1-0. On the outside corner, strike one. And there's Parliament. Runner goes from first. The 1-1's one in the dirt and no play. So Schliger takes second without even any attention. Nobody went to cover either, so there was no plan to throw to second. Yeah, once Rutgers brought the infield in, uh, that was a gimme. And just a matter of uh, guessing on the right pitch. Make sure that they, they wouldn't back into it, but... Once the infield is in, in that position, there's no way that they can get over there to potentially catch a potential throw. 2-1. Down to get it. Aline carries it high in the sky to right. Sheikhoffer running out of room. It's gone! It's a three-run home run! A majestic shot from Chris Aline. Three massive insurance runs for the Terrapins. They take a 9-4 lead in the ninth. Chris Aline's third home run of this series and the most significant of them all. And he faces Nick LaRusso first. And there's strike one. Yeah, uh, all series long, uh, uh, Maryland shows, even in their loss, uh, uh, they just w they wear you out. Uh, and it was a second look. This is rolled over to third. Santa Maria's got it, and there's one out. It was their second, second day getting a look at Sam Portnoy. They make adjustments, uh, and, and of course the, the error changed everything because if not for the error, it's at worst, you figure you get the out at second, probably not a double play ball. Elaine still bats, but it's a different situation. Well, now Matt Shaw to the plate. There's ball one. Uh, Kevin Keister worked the leadoff walk, and then Luke Schliger hit a ball back to Portnoy that could have been two, but Portnoy threw it over the shortstop to Giorgio's head, and the next batter, that was Chris Aline. 2-0 uh, the count now to Shaw. How about, by the way, the fact we talked about it yesterday, Chris Aline opting to come back for a fifth year after he wasn't drafted last year. He's now got a career high in Big Ten best 17 home runs and he's the second Big Ten player to reach 60 RBI now. And that's why he was named, uh, given the number three jersey, which is a recent tradition, started in 2015 by the Maryland program. Three meaning three pillars of Maryland baseball success. That's ball four to Shaw, so he's on on the four-pitch walk. And, and he was the obvious choice to get it because, uh, as Rob Vaughn described, when you get a guy that comes back for his fifth year, and is disappointed after not Troy. getting drafted, it goes one of two ways. Either they're a little lackadaisical, uh, they're frustrated, they should have been drafted, feel like they shouldn't be in college anymore, uh, or they're kind of just thinking about the next level, whether it's academically. Uh, they feel like they should, have, um, they should have had a different circumstance. Or they go the other way, they take advantage of that last year, uh, and that's what Chris Elaine did. He was always very good, tough as nails. He's battled back from injuries. But ahead of his fifth year, the way he went about his day-to-day -day business in the fall of 21 uh, allowed him to be given that honor of wearing the number three jersey at Maryland. Mazza bends in a curveball to Troy Schreffler. today batting with Matt Shaw on first and three runs in here in the top of the ninth for the Terrapins on that Aline home run. And those three pillars of Maryland baseball. Yeah, it's it, toughness yep. is one uh, and uh, he's shown that a couple years ago. He played with like a broken thumb, some other injuries Aline did. Uh, number two is ownership and growth mindset. Ownership of your mistakes this is hit well on the ground. Rutgers tries to turn two again. There's one. 
And there's two. They go around to the horn to get it. Six, uh, five, four, three. But Chris Aline strikes in a huge way in the top of the ninth. He goes all the way down to the top of the plate to find it. It's a three-run home run. And because of that shot, the Terrapins now lead 9-4, to four, going to the bottom of the ninth, looking for a series win. Uh, his leadership, the way he rises, everybody's level of play on a day-to-day -day basis with his work ethic and then growth mindset is the last of the three pillars of Maryland baseball that that, that number three jersey uh, personifies that Chris Elaine gets to wear uh, in his final year. And that's just putting yourself out there into uh, uncomfortable spots, being brave enough uh, to enter that arena uh, and uh, embrace the failure and try to grow through that. And, and baseball is full of failure. Even if you're outstanding, you're still failing 65% of the time as a, as a hitter. We are on the bottom of the ninth. This Rutgers team has come back from some significant deficits during their Big Ten slate, but this would be the toughest yet. With David Falco in for a third inning of work. And facing Richie Schiekoffer. That looks like a pinch hitter on deck as well, and then the top of the order. It's strike two. You know, waiting on deck right now is Mike Neister. He would bat for Jason Shockley in the catcher spot. Shockley came in after the starting catcher, Andy Axelson, was pinch hit for. So Rutgers just trying to get guys on base and get home run hitters to the dish. 2-2. Two -two. Strike three on the outside corner. Falco picks up a strikeout, his first K of the day. One gone in the ninth. You've got to throw strikes. Uh, you've got to make Rutgers earn their way on. The free passes ignite big innings. And Falco, despite the fact that he's now 36 pitches in, is throwing strikes. After starting the outing with a little bit of control issues. A Long Island native trying to pitch Merrill into a series win. Strike two. This is a Terrapin team that has some huge performances on the road. Their best two series win, non-conference against Baylor and Campbell, were sweeps on the road. The pitch, a half swing on appeal, no swing. Yeah, he's just coming after Rutgers with fastballs and, and locating it. That's the right call from Steven Leonardo, who's our first base umpire. Got the chance to chime in. Falco's 1-2. That's foul back. Falco last weekend took the loss in the middle game against Northwestern, throwing the eighth inning, then came back through an inning and two thirds on Sunday. Neister hits it over to second. Keister scoops it, and Rutgers is down to its final out. Oh, this would go a huge way. Lasco hits it high to center. Aline drifting. In the alley, makes the catch, and the ball game is over. The Maryland Terrapins lead it the entire way, and they win two out of three on the road at number one Rutgers. The Big Ten leading Scarlet Knights. The Terrapins are headed back to College Park with two massive wins.